Welcome to our classroom, folks. Today, I am joined by not one guest, but two. Yes, y'all. Double the fun, double the enjoyment, double the learning with the doctors. Dr. Wallace Panlilio II, who is PhD and experienced educator and entrepreneur. He holds a PhD in educational psychology and has served for headmaster for 14 years. He also holds two master's degrees in entrepreneurship and educational leadership and has studied economics and political science at the undergrad level. He's currently chief mentor officer of Digital Ventures PTE, an AI solutions and publishing company. And I'm also joined by Dr. Art Yum Zinchenko, PhD, an accomplished author and cognitive neuroscientist with extensive experience in the field. <laughs> he earned his doctorate in cognitive neuroscience from the Max Planck Institute for Cognitive Human and Brain Sciences in Leipzig, where his research focused on emotions and cognitive conflicting processing. And so I got one individual who's joining me from the Philippines, another one who's joining me from Germany, and I'm here in the United States in Tampa, Florida. So we are covering a spectrum on the geographical map today. Thank you for joining me to talk about test anxiety. Welcome to our classroom. Thank you very much for having us today, and nice to uh, be here. Well, Thank you, indeed. Uh, such a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you could be here. I know you have a publication that is coming out soon, Wisest Learners, and you, you've covered a number of different topics in your publication that could be useful to parents, useful to educators, and, and I love the fact that uh, we, we, we got this science uh, approach, so there's a lot of research in terms of the scientific work that y'all have done, and I'm interested to learn more about that because test anxiety is not a topic that I've talked about too much here on the platform in our classroom, but it is something that comes up. It is something that's common, and so interested to learn with you as it relates to that topic. So we're going to go ahead and jump in, and we'll go ahead and, and start with, with you, Wallace. Can you provide a brief overview of what test anxiety is and why it's an important topic for parents to be aware of. I don't want to assume that our listeners automatically know what test anxiety is. So maybe you could just give us a brief overview. Uh, for a brief overview, it's essentially a combination of uh, various uh, symptoms that involve stress, tension, uh, worries, uh, fear of failure, that happens before or uh, during test situations. Now, parents are definitely, uh, will, definitely parents will be caring or uh, will be uh, concerned about test anxiety because uh, it affects test performance. And as, as, as we all know, uh, tests are very important in life. Like tests uh, involve uh, helping people get to the next level. And that's why there's also that uh, level of anxiety, and that's where parents uh, should be. Uh, that's what parents should be concerned about because it affects their children's uh, future, and that perform the way their children will perform uh, in uh, in during tests will uh, will impact how they will be uh, as uh, uh, as learners, how how they will be as a professionals uh, or business people down there. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Art, I'm, I'm curious in terms of the common factors that contribute to test anxiety in children. So there are many factors that contribute to test anxiety. And um, one of the things is that tests are really prominent. And uh, on average, in K-12 education in the U.S., there are like approximately 112 big tests and exams not counting like small pop-up quizzes, you know, verbal, um, you know, exams and so on. So, you know, exams are all over the place. And 
um, one of the reasons, um, you know, people may experience some anxiety um, could be their test performance abilities, right? So the the knowledge or you know the the uh, the subject. There is this uh, something that came comes to my mind first. Like there's a big study by Plantain colleagues recently, who's you know interviewed or like uh, you know ran a questionnaire, surveyed all, almost uh, fifteen hundred students, and what they were looking at is how the students' um, test anxiety was. How anxious were the students? while taking uh, high stakes exams. And at the same time, they were measuring their uh, performance in different uh, subjects like math and uh, English and so, and so on. And what was interesting is that students' um, knowledge, like math knowledge and English knowledge at the beginning of the year could predict students' test anxiety at the end of the year. So there's a strong relationship between the knowledge, so like how well students are prepared for the test or like for any, you know, how they're doing in that subject and their test performance, um, yes, how, how, how they're perform, performing. However, interestingly, uh, and test anxiety, interestingly, this relationship is not linear. It doesn't mean that, you know, the better you are in a, in a certain subject, the, the more you know, the better of a student you are, like the brighter you are as a student, the less lesser is your uh, test anxiety, but there is some sort of a U shape uh, dependency. So students who are underperforming or are in lowest twentieth percentile of, of the cohort, they have higher test anxiety. But what was a bit counterintuitive at first was that the students who are in the tw like upper twentieth percentile, so who students who are uh, performing like some of the best students in the group, also had higher test anxiety as well. So test anxiety does depend on the knowledge, but it's not all of it. So there are some more factors that contribute. And uh, when it comes to um, you know, high performing students, that would be the social pressure to perform. Um, and the pressure could be coming you know, from different um, people. It could be teachers, could be peers. And you know, of course, parents play a big role. So, um, you know, the, the expectations that are, you know, that uh, we have or as teachers, as as parents um, can really, really influence the kids as um, our ki children's test anxiety. And it's it's understandable, right? If you're a straight A student and then all of a sudden you got a B, which is also a good mark, but uh, that's, you know, um, a worse performance for you than it used to be or something is wrong. You maybe did not prepare well. And, you know, the students start um, feeling that pressure. Um, yeah, and then that's maybe one of the biggest uh, influences. Like, why do we feel test anxiety? Like, what do we do kids have test anxiety and adults as well, right? So pressure to perform. And the second probably um, the strongest, the second strong point would be the fear to fail. So um, sometimes, um, we, we, especially with during high stakes exam, but uh, also on the smaller tests, um, there is this because we have this fear of um, you know but, but because of this pressure, we also can have a fear to fail. So every time you uh, fail an exam, it could be that you know uh, you start catastrophizing, uh, especially like in elementary school and middle school. Kids think like, that's it. I will get kicked out of school. Um, my parents will not love me anymore. So they start exaggerating. And, um, you know, this exaggeration leads to test anxiety. A third factor could be negative experiences. Um, if you, you fail once, if there is one test that you could not, you know, uh, complete successfully, there is this idea that, okay, now it will happen again. So you have this experience in the past and you keep um, thinking that it will happen again and again. And um, also, a bit more objective, I would say uh, the fourth factor could be learning difficulties. There are some kids who really experience difficulties memorizing, understanding material, learning, and those objectively their test performance is lower. And at some point, just because it happens again and again and again, so you know negative experiences uh, kick in, uh, they start uh, you know feeling really bad about tests. Uh, uh, if you're feeling dreadful, feeling uh, fear and, and worrying about test performance. And uh, yeah, so that's, uh, 
in this case, there are, are objective reasons, maybe uh, not the most appropriate learning methods are used or not enough time uh, is invested. And um, the final point could be, uh, you know, lack of preparation. So kids are able to learn, they, they know the best strategies, but they just um, do not prepare well for an exam uh, for various reasons. And um, that could, of course, elicit uh, yeah, test anxiety. Yeah, I mean, something that comes to mind for me as you share all of this and break down common factors contributing to test anxiety in children, I, I also wonder about the way we design our assessments, right? I don't think we consider and talk enough about our role as educators and and also policymakers, right? Like we have these, so what's, what feels oftentimes like really outdated ways to assess children. And if we're really wanting to get at and understand what they know, how can we just be assessing them in one way? Right. And instead of offering mm -hmm. a multitude of ways to assess what learners know, what skills they've mastered. Right. Because I'll use a personal example. I'm not I, I've never considered myself a great test taker. Can I pass a test? Sure. But I don't think I'm a great test taker. Now, I don't think I'm terrible either. Not. I think I'm a pretty average test taker. But the test does not, especially if we're talking about like traditional way to assess, right? Here's, here's a paper, you know, fill in the bubble, fill in the blank, you know, write a few paragraphs. If, if we're just looking at it in this very narrow way of assessing, then... I think it's easy for us to overlook the the knowledge that our learners have and the skills that they've mastered, right? What if we ask them to create a project? You know, what if we ask them to to narrate their learning? What if we ask them to utilize technology to create something that demonstrates what they learn? And so, you, you know, while this this comes to mind for me, I mean, you were a headmaster for fourteen years. To talk to me. Uh, about your perspective in terms of what you were seeing from your students' experience in schools and, and the way y'all were doing assessment. And do you feel that tension also? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, and what, um, I'd like to share with you uh, when I um, when I took over uh, our school, uh, I introduced this program called uh, Projects and Presentations. So I patterned it after Toastmasters Club, where people get to do public speaking and uh, they do projects. And interesting enough, uh, this kind of approach uh, uh, in the Philippines and in many countries in Asia is uh, a deviation from the norm because the norm would be would have been uh, your school activity should have been anything that has to do with tests. And public speaking, for the most part, it's not about pen and paper tests. But interesting enough, when the students graduated and they did a survey and asked, uh, and asked um, the alumni what school activity was that uh, had helped you, had helped you in, uh, in university the most out of all. So we did so many things, right? You know, math, English science, uh, writing, uh, testing, uh, so many things, right? But the one thing about 70 to 80% of the alumni said that the biggest one was the project and presentation, which was not about pen and paper testing, but it was about public speaking where people, uh, their peers get to listen to them orally and they get to give feedback. It doesn't mean that pen and paper tests don't have a place in society. Sure. Definitely, that has a place, right? Um, and one reason is because it's the easiest to to facilitate, <laughs> right? Uh, 
but uh, it doesn't it doesn't uh, excuse uh, educators from uh, being creative and innovative and coming up with uh, other ways to uh, evaluate uh, what uh, their uh, students are are, lear are learning have learned uh, in in class. Yeah, it's absolutely. Sorry, you, you were going to add to that? I just wanted to add one thing that uh, really like what Wallace said about presentations um, being very interesting on the one hand for students to, you know, to talk, to get feedback from, from peers and, you know, uh, fellow students. But on the other hand, making a presentation is much more, like has much more involvement relative to just, you know, answering, you know, crossing these bubbles on a multiple choice test that, you know, you may, you know, cram just really try to memorize roads learn uh, material and then you'd be you can pass the test right but once you're making a presentation for instance right or a project it means that you're there uh, presenting showing slides or like discussing a point and then you really need to know the material to prepare to to present well right because you'll get some questions you know clarification questions follow-up questions or questions that um you need to uh, come up with a solution based on the you know, information you've learned, right? It's not kind of written in the book already what the answers uh, are. Um, so I think it's a, it's it's a great way to um, uh, you know to to assess students' knowledge. Um, on the other hand, we should also realize that you know given that there are so many subjects and so many tests that we have to you know to take to to pass certain classes, and it's not always possible to do. So I think. Even in like in the best of the worlds, we, I guess it's quite difficult to go away from you know standard uh, pen and paper uh, tests. And my feeling is that even given that we have such you know um, an ideal way to uh, sometimes to evaluate students' performance, we can still prepare students as teachers to to perform well to avoid test anxiety. Um, there there are some sort of points we could make, right? For instance, you know, set clear expectations. You know, let students know what should they learn, what what, what is expected from them. So it's kind of not a, a black box, but they have a clear idea of what to prepare for. And maybe uh, talk to students about test anxiety, that such a phenomenon exists. And it's nothing to be, uh, be ashamed of, or um, maybe it's uh, time to ask for help if it's necessary, right? So not to kind of try to suppress it and hide it. So uh, being open and transparent about this definitely helps. Um, so there are studies that show that, uh, you know, uh, female students are more impacted by test anxiety. There is a slight imbalance there. So maybe teachers could pay attention to more to female students or offer, uh, you know, extra care a bit, knowing that there is such a, uh, such a finding, such a phenomenon. And um, one more approach would be to provide some mocking tests. You know, uh, you know, you you scaffold test performance. You offer example questions so that you desynthesize this you know unknown uh, test that is coming. But you kind of let students expect, experience it a bit in, in advance so that they come prepared. They are not worried or overly worried, right? So, this test anxiety, as well as was saying in the beginning, like it's the, the arousal, the physiological arousal, like increased heartbeat and, you know, um, you know, wet palms and so on. But um, it's an, kind of an overreaction of the body. So like a, a, a slight feeling of uh, anxiousness is not that, all that bad. It's again, like a U-shaped uh, performance. If you're completely relaxed about the test, you may not perform as well. If you're overly uh, reacting, then you're also not performing well. So you should have, you should be somewhere in the, in, in, in between, right? So it'd be kind of, uh, tends to bit so that you are paying more attention, you're prepared, uh, but not too much. So, yes, I, I, it's it's a great point that, of course, we could use different ways to evaluate kids and provide them with opportunities to, you know, uh, to take part in projects and presentations. And uh, we could also do more to try to reduce test anxiety, even on, you know, classical uh, pen and paper tests. And I'm wondering about te how technology ties into all of this. And and either one of you or both of you can respond to this particular question. But uh, how, how does the use of technology such as online assessments and remote learning impact test anxiety in children? 
<clears throat> so there are pros and cons. Uh, the pro could be something like uh, being familiar with the technology gives uh, a level of familiarity uh, on the part of the student that can reduce uh, anxiety. Uh, at the same time, being uh, able to uh, take the test in more familiar environment. If let's say like during the pandemic, so many have taken tests in uh, like uh, at home, right? So right. it's a familiar environment. So they, uh, some would some would say that uh, oh they're more relaxed because it's it's their home court, so to speak, right? Uh, but at the same time, uh, it, there can also be some aggravation when it comes to anxiety because technical issues can can happen, right? Like, you know, like preparing, it's almost like preparing for a big event and suddenly your your Wi-Fi starts to go haywire or you can't, uh, your your uh, your laptop starts to go crazy on you. So uh, that can uh, add to the, to the anxiety as well. Or for some, just being connected socially with their peers, with their, you know, with your classmates, your teachers, that gives a, a level of uh, assurance and not being around them during let's say an online environment, uh, online testing environment can add uh, that kind of anxiety as well. What I did a study of uh, screen time, uh, um, excessive screen time for many students. And um, one thing that came out is that uh, it uh, there's, there is a high percentage of uh, emotional irritability in uh, in in students who experience the uh, um, uh, excessive uh, screen time, and that can that can vary from one person to the other, but it's uh, it's something uh, it's an experience of having anxiety that can translate to uh, test anxiety as well. So overly uh, exposed to uh, to screen devices can can be a contributing uh, factor. Mm. So um, maybe I would add a few words uh, if I may. So um, we when we spoke about the factors of test anxiety, we said that like lack of preparation or maybe inefficient learning mechanism, learning skills could all contribute to test anxiety because that would maybe sometimes lead to a failure. Um, you know, elicit negative experiences, and then you know there, there's a pressure from from outside. But the the, the one of the core reasons there uh, could be the the lack of preparation. And when you study remotely, especially during pandemic, and I could see it with my kids and my son studying online, one would need to have a really high level of self discipline and dedication, right? Because there is no teacher around you who would be you know paying extra attention, extra care, and looking that. You know, checking that you're reading, reading the material and not browsing, uh, you know, surfing online. Um, so that requires a lot of uh, self-discipline. And here, the, the the learning techniques, the learning strategies kick in. They play a big role, I would say, especially when you uh, study remotely, uh, you have online courses. And that's one of the, the chapters in our book that we, you know, spend a lot of time on discussing the, the learning techniques. What is the best way to, um, you know, uh, encode information? What is the best way to retain information? How can you um, understand things better, right? So, I mean, one could use elaboration or, um, you know, spaced recall, spaced repetition relative to, to a cramming. So we could go in, mo in more detail if necessary, right, about individual strategies, but strategies do play a big role and um, one should maybe pay attention to that. And uh, when speaking about the learning strategies, there is this recent work from 2022 um, by Maria Thebold in, in Frankfurt in Germany. So what they did, they looked at how test anxiety affects a medical students' uh, test performance. And what they did basically, they um, had a big, a large sample of participants who were preparing for uh, 100 days um, uh, taking a high stakes exam in, in medicine. And there were, Test anxiety was an independent variable, so they were trying to see how test anxiety predicts test performance. And in fact, they could show that the higher the test anxiety in these 300 plus students, the lower it was the test performance, which was kind of expected and shown many times. But the, the interesting point was that if they included 
um, the, the, the exam preparation, the objective exam preparation, the knowledge of students into the regression, there was no effect of test anxiety on test performance. So there was no effect of test anxiety beyond the knowledge of participants. Yeah. So knowledge of students. And they had a really interesting way to analyze how, like the knowledge, you know, how would you do it objectively, right? So they had a test, uh, uh, an online platform where students were preparing for these tests. And uh, the, the, the platform offered students questions that were coming from previous year's exams. So they kind of like example questions that could come or like something similar would be available on the actual exam. And what the researchers were able to do, they were able to collect logs from these preparations. So they knew how well the students performed on these mock exams or you know, mock questions. And so the better they were performing during these prep tests, the better their performance was on the actual exam. This is also clear. But as I said, like, the interesting part was that this knowledge, the ability, like you know, the, the, the learning success during these 100 days of test preparation, um, uh, you know, overshadowed the test anxiety. Uh, so, which again underlines the, the 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 effective learning part, right? So you need to use a better learning strategies, uh, better you know uh, approaches to learning to prepare well for an exam. And then um, I, it's quite difficult to say if it would work for everyone, if it would work for elementary uh, school or for middle school, right? But it seems that the, there is some evidence that better test preparation can take over and can. Um, uh, limit the effect of test anxiety. Thanks, thanks for sharing. So, <clears throat> you you cover some of this content in your upcoming publication, Wisest Learners. What else do you want to tell our audience about your your pending publication? We covered in our in the book Wisest Learners uh, certain uh, aspects of. Uh, of learning and uh, a big part of it that uh, we kind of like advocate over and over again is that in order for parents, educators and learners to be truly successful in addressing learning issues or achieving learning goals is to recognize that the solutions are, are should not be perceived as one size fits all. Right. We should see the different aspects of learning as interconnected. We should see the different aspects of uh, learning as holistic. If we are able to do that, then, ah, Eureka, we will then start to see better and better solutions. Because one of the biggest problems that I've seen is that people tend to want uh, that magic pill okay, I take this and voila, right? I'm able to address all the learning problems of, of my child, my student. But the reality is there's no easy, quick formula. You really have to recognize that uh, a person is a complex being, that there are so many aspects to it. And it's not as simple as, uh, as teaching a certain strategy. When I was in uh, Melbourne, Australia, a couple of months back, uh, one of my family friend's uh, son uh, approached me uh, over dinner and shared with me that uh, he's moving to Australia, Melbourne, and uh, he's and he's going to take up uh, his uh, undergrad. And he said that, uh, he called me like Uncle Wallace. Uncle Wallace, I'm so scared. Why are you so scared? Because I've always failed in the past. I've always failed in school. I didn't do so well. And I have to like sit down and really encourage him and how he can overcome that. If you think about it, some people might just uh, teach him strategies right off the bat. But without addressing his lack of confidence, but without addressing the issues that he had about his past failures, no amount of teaching about strategies will do the work. He has to address the internal first before he can move forward. So 
it's a it's a simple example, but I saw that over and over again in in school, and that's something that I have to learn uh, from many experiences uh, in working with parents, teachers, and and students. And I hope that that's also something that uh, our listeners will be able to to see that when it comes to learning, we have to recognize that this requires a more holistic approach and uh, these learning aspects are all interconnected. That's a good point. I would re agree. And then as well as said, the holistic approach is very important. And unfortunately, that's the truth, right? We cannot just um, improve one skill or one, you know, ability in a child and let them succeed in school and, you know, become, you know, li uh, long li uh, lifelong learners. And that's the aim of our book is to provide parents, in this case, parents, we have a um, teacher's ed edition coming early next year, but uh, the wisest learners, uh, parents edition is coming in January. And um, so the, the, the aim of that book is to uh, equip parents, first of all, with understanding about some of the you know, major uh, principles uh, that are important for, for uh, raising a, a wisest learner, as we call it, uh, but you know, a lifelong learner, someone who, is, um, who has like a second nature of acquiring new information, of learning and constantly advancing, as you know, the, the modern times kind of dictate. Um, right, so what, just in few words, what we uh, kind of advocate for, what we share with the readers is that learning is also not only about the learning principles uh, you know how to acquire information, but uh, it also includes a lot of uh, emotional, motivational components. It includes a lot of metacognition. It includes a lot of uh, self-efficacy and uh, you know belief in one's abilities to perform. Um, yes, and there are some things that you know students have to do. Some they, they have to realize early on. The earlier, the better. And there are some things that parents need to know. Parents need to realize about learning and. Um, we, we were trying to address it in our book. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, learning has to be holistic, and we need all the stakeholders to do their part. Um, that's a good summary. <laughs> <laughs> so, a few things here as we wrap up. First of all, if you had an opportunity to have lunch with anybody, <laughs> dead or alive, who would it be and why? Um, so I'll, I'll start first. Uh, uh, just yesterday, I. I I was uh, I heard a really terrible news that one of our good family friends uh, passed away, and it's uh, um, yeah, we're uh, really saddened by this uh, by this news uh, because the the father the our family friends uh, are dad with uh, two kids, uh, and left a, a young mom and um, and his young and uh, it was really a big shock uh, uh he had a major stroke and in four days uh passed away wow and i um to answer your question i would want to have lunch with his two kids mm. because i i would like to um take the time to offer them comfort and uh and my and to minister to them through my presence and whether through lack of words or through through my words to be able to give them an assurance that uh, they will not be a, they will not be alone and i'm sharing this um, because i feel that all of us can always impact people one way or the other and we should not let go let we should not lose the opportunity to impact lives, whether in big or small ways, and with my friend, like I, I, I wasn't able to, like I wish I would wish I had spent more time with him, but, but now that he's he's gone, I would want to spend time with his children. Yeah, that sounds that. like that would be a blessing for his children, um, and hopefully also a blessing to you. Thank you for sharing that. And um, if I could pick someone to have lunch with or like to talk with uh, spend some time talking to i would probably um i would love to meet with paul pintrich paul pintrich was uh, a big figure in um you know uh, social sciences and in cognitive psychologist or the researcher 
who influenced um, my view on education, my view on, you know, um, on holistic approach to learning. And that's um, a big person with some over 90,000 citations, uh, a lot, a lot. So a very uh, prominent figure. And uh, I think our book benefited a lot, for, you know, from learning from the research of Paul Pinterest. So that would be him. Thank you. Thank you. So any final words of advice or encouragement for parents who are navigating the challenges of helping children cope with test anxiety or for educators? So I would encourage uh, parents and teachers in, in, as they uh, want to, as they go in this journey of wanting to help uh, their children or uh, students, that it is uh, it is a journey of highs and lows. It will never be perfect. What's important is that the trajectory is going up <laughs> and that we're making progress, even if there will be occasional downs, but as long as you're, you yourself believe that uh, uh, you're willing to learn, you're open for correction, you're open to uh, uh, listen to other people, to, to be a lifelong learner, and that you're open to making mistakes and not to be uh, stifled by fear of failure, then I would encourage you that uh, uh, all of you, uh, educators, parents, and even learners, that it's okay to make mistakes, but keep on making uh, making uh, good strides, keep on moving forward, and and you will find find yourself making good pro progress down the road. And later on, you'll just say that uh, oh, I already walked. 10,000 miles and I, you know, I, I didn't even really uh, uh, feel that it was a long journey because uh, I enjoyed the journey. And from my side, I would say both parents and teachers, I think, should stay conscious about this, about this problematic of test anxiety that exists. And um, it's quite wide, widespread, you know, according to some statistics, 10 to 40 percent of students may experience test anxiety at some point of their uh, you know, schooling time. And, but test anxiety is not something that, you know, we can do something about test anxiety. There are techniques, there are ways to evaluate, to assess, to identify test anxiety. There are ways to, you know, deal with it. We can help children uh, overcome this. And so one should stay aware of this and monitor. And in case if there is, it's not possible to overcome this, you know, by using the, the, the strategies that we also address in our book. Um, it's always important to contact the professionals, psychologists in the right time and uh, help children overcome that. Appreciate the encouragement. Lastly, where can we find these resources? I know your, your book is coming out soon. Where can folks learn more about your work? Uh, where can they, they find the book, Wisest Learners? Where can they be more informed about what Dr. Wallace Panlilio is doing and, and what Dr. Artyom Zinchenko is doing? So the, our book is uh, uh, available for pre-order on Amazon. Uh, just type uh, Wisest Learners and uh, uh, you'll be able to uh, pre-order. Uh, also, we have our wisestlearners.com website. So we pretty much uh, will put uh, you know, post all of the or all of our activities uh, there, uh, all the relevant activities relate in relation to wisest learners. And we do come up with like our Instagram uh, messages uh, that are related to uh, learning and. Um, uh, also with our blog articles from different uh, publications from time to time. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to add uh, that we also have a blog post uh, page on our webpage. So if you're interested to 
look into our other articles uh, apart from the book that are freely available for everyone. So please feel free to visit thewisestlearners.com and um, see if you like it. Well, thank you for your time. Wishing you much success. I'm uh, looking forward to continue to dig into some of these strategies. I have three young children, ages eight, five, and three. So uh, certainly these are things that I need to keep fresh on my mind and, and utilize the proactive strategies that you're offering to be able to identify any potential rising anxieties that I see in my children when it comes to assessments. I think that's a good age to, you know, to read the book. I mean, I think it's available, like it, it would be suitable for all ages, but you know, your age, of, you know, <laughs> would be the, the, the best time to start. So, yeah. Well, thanks for your work. Keep pressing on, keep moving forward, keep doing the research and sharing it with the world. Appreciate you being in our classroom. Thank you so much for ha having us uh, today. Thank you for having us.